Hey everybody, this is Garrett with Earth and Time, and welcome to day three of my road trip from Houston, Texas to Capitol Reef, Utah. I spent last night in Farmington, New Mexico, a nice little town here along the Animas River, and now I'm on my way and I will make it today to Capitol Reef. So come join me, let's go take a road trip together and go see what we can learn about. One of my favorite things about traveling is finding unique places and unique items like this sculpture here on the corner of downtown Farmington. Here's a view of Main Street, Farmington, New Mexico. It's about six in the morning, so most things are closed. It's very quiet down here, but there's a number of shops here. There's even a museum of Navajo art and culture. Uh, there's a Tota. I think it's a theater for like plays and productions down there. You'll see there's these old timey signs in these different areas. In fact, this one's called Wallace Furniture and the neon's still slightly on. And if I keep panning around this way, you can see this old Allen movie theater as well. It is a nice little downtown area. I wish I had more time to explore it, but I need to get on the road today. So we will see you all at the next stop. stop the Four Corners Monument in I was going to say which state but it's in four states so right now I'm standing in New Mexico I'm gonna go head over to Arizona then Utah then Colorado let's go check out the Four Corners Monument each of the states are represented so here's New Mexico Arizona's flag there Utah's flag over in the distance over there and here's Colorado's flag showing where we're at. Actually, right now, if I look down, I'm standing between Colorado and New Mexico, I think. <laughs> and so I'm standing between two states. Now let's go try to stand between all four. Here's some more information about the Four Corners. And something I didn't know is that the Four Corners have actually moved. What I mean by that is where they surveyed the actual Four Corners between the four states has actually moved multiple times throughout history, with the first one being set up in 1868. And they show roughly where that Four Corners was at. And then they later came back and resurveyed in 1875. It ended up way down here. And then, well, I say way, this is probably just within uh, feet of each other or meters of each other. And then 1901, they had it here. 1878, it was up here. Eventually in 1992, they had a surveyor come and they put the exact location with more modern techniques. And they were able to pinpoint the actual Four Corners of the four states right over there. Pretty cool bit of history. I had no idea. And it's amazing how much they've moved. And they don't say the exact amount. There's not scale bars here, but I'm guessing these must be feet or meters distance around this central area. So I may be having way too much fun because now I'm in New Mexico. Now I'm in Arizona. New Mexico, Arizona. Awesome. All right, standing on the corner between the four states. And if I look this way, Colorado, now I'm in Utah, now I'm in Arizona, and now I'm in New Mexico. If you come visit the Four Corners Monument, it's $8 per person to get in. Dogs are not allowed within this main area of the Four Corners, so the actual monument behind me. However, dogs are allowed in the general parking area. There are some picnic tables, there are restrooms here as well, if you need to use them. And there are a number of vendors here selling arts and crafts from the region. It's time to get on the road again, so I will see you all at the next stop.
what I found in Blanding, Utah, a dinosaur museum. You know I've got to go in and go check this out. So let's go take a look and see what kind of dinosaurs they have here. Now we're in Utah, and specifically in southeastern Utah, and there's a number of dinosaur species that have been discovered in this area, especially north of here towards Moab, Utah, which is famous for arches and canyon lands. So let's go see what kind of dinosaurs they have inside of this museum. First impression, wow. This is a nice museum. I'm really excited to explore. And I turned around and check out this giant ammonite. So ammonites were a nautiloid that lived during the time of the dinosaurs or actually technically a cephalopod. So you can imagine a giant squid head coming out of the top of this thing. And this was its shell, much like the modern day nautiloids or nautiluses. The museum looks like it's set up according to time period. So we're gonna start in the Permian. So this is before the time of the dinosaurs and you'll see what the planet looked like at that time. So we were in Pangaea was the supercontinent and you'll see where North America is at over here and Utah would be kind of towards that Western edge or the left-hand edge of that. During this time was a time of large amphibians Probably one of the most famous is actually a Dimetrodon. And I actually think these are neither reptile or amphibian. I think they're a Therapsid, which is a, a, a different distinction of a, a type of animal or family of animals. And this is one of the, what one of the Dimetrodons looks like. Ah, so I'll correct myself. A sailback Pelicosaur, a Dimetrodon. So it's a Pelicosaur. Interesting. So this is all pre-dinosaurs, but you can start looking at something like a Dimetrodon and start thinking, wow, we must be approaching that time of the dinosaurs when you see something like that. Here's one of the amphibians. And here's another one of the amphibians that would have lived during that time, a Seymoria. And I imagine the Dimetrodons were probably eating these critters. Whoa, look at that thing. That looks like something out of a sci-fi movie. So this is a, and I'll probably butcher this, a Estamomonsuchus. So <laughs> I apologize, I, my Latin is not great, but this was a mammal-like reptile found in Russia during the Permian period. That's really cool. And then here are some more mammal-like reptiles. And you can see what they look like. They even have like a bit of a saber tooth look to them. And they're eating one of the, I think they're called Gorgonosauruses or Gorgonosauruses. And here's what one of those would look like. Look, they have like a saber tooth style. And here's another one. Wow, so these were mammal-like reptiles of the Triassic. So I guess I've now moved in from this mammal-like reptile in the Permian into the Triassic. And now we're in the Triassic period or the Great Transition. So this is when the earliest dinosaurs started to appear. And they have some fossils through here. Let's find out what this one is from that time period. This is a, a Platyosaurus, and it's a prosauropod. So sauropods were things like the big Brontosaurus, or you can think of Diplodocus, the big long neck, whip-tailed style of dinosaurs. And so this would have been an early ancestor to one of those. And next to it is a Herorosaurus. And this would have lived, it looks like, in the Argentinian area. And this would have been one of the meat eaters from the Triassic. And you can see it's, you can see how the different Coelurosaurs were distributed around the globe. So they show where all the discoveries are around here. And I apologize, there's a bit of a glare from the lights. And this is the prosauropods where they found them. So that's one thing that's interesting. Today, obviously, all these continents are separated. But at one point when they were all part of Pangaea, these animals would have been able to roam freely from north to south, east to west, in almost one continuous landmass. Now we moved into the Jurassic, which is kind of one of the peak times of the dinosaurs, hence Jurassic Park and, and all the play on that. So this is one of the rooms that shows some of the animals that were around during the Jurassic. So things like Stegosaurus and the Carnotaurus, which we actually saw on the road trip on, what was that, day number one, we saw a version of this at that, that dinosaur parade. 
And this is by far my favorite dinosaur, as you all know, the Allosaurus, which is also the state dinosaur of Utah. All right, I wasn't able to find where they actually had the start of the Cretaceous, but as I walk into this room, this is definitely all part of the Cretaceous from the Guanodons, which are hadrosaurs. And one thing I like is that they really tackle and talk about this idea of dinosaurs having feathers, not scales, especially by the time you get into the Cretaceous period. So here's a picture of Dino Nikus on the left-hand side with kind of classic skin. Now there are skin impressions, so they have an idea what dinosaur skin looks like. However, we now have examples of feathers on dinosaurs. And so this is probably more accurately what it could have looked like. Pretty cool that they tackle that subject here at this museum. Is a Styracosaur, which is a relative to the Ceratopsians, or it is a Ceratopsian, it's not a Triceratops, but it's part of the Ceratopsian family. There were a lot of Ceratopsians found in this area, including Ceratopsian tracks that have been found in Utah, which is really cool. And similar to the other maps, this shows during the Cretaceous, you can see that the continents are starting to split apart. So you can see where South America fits in with Africa. And you can see the Ceratopsians really are focused in North America. So these are the Triceratops, the dinosaur I just showed you. And then you can see some other relatives on them, maybe the Protoceratopsians on the uh, eastern part of Asia. But you can get an idea that now that the continents are starting to spread apart, there's getting a little bit more of isolation from the different types of dinosaurs. As I walk through here, you can also see they have different movie memorabilia and movie posters about dinosaurs. Dinosaurs have also played an important role in cinema, of course. Who doesn't love dinosaurs, right? And how exciting they are. So they actually have a section here talking about filming and making old dinosaur movies. And you can look through here and you can see how this is set up like a movie scene for stop animation. So this is how some of the earliest dinosaur movies were made. And then as I walk around, you can see how the stop animation set was set up. <gasps> Check this out. This is the original model that was used as the brontosaurus in King Kong and also as a sea beast in the son of King Kong. So this is the original model used for both those. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And it was based off this idea of the Apatosaurus or Brontosaurus. That's awesome. What cool movie memorabilia. By far the most famous dinosaur of the Cretaceous was the Tyrannosaurus Rex, right? It's so imposing, it's so large. It has tiny little arms and a big head but so impressive that something that large lived at one time. And check this beast out. This is a Therizinosaur. And they actually found one of these here found in some ancient ocean deposits. So they think it died and floated out to sea, sank and was preserved. Look at the size of this thing. The latest Jurassic Park has one of these stalking through if you remember, and he uses his claws to, to help kill the, was it the Carnotosaurus, I believe, in the new Jurassic Park. Pretty cool. And they're so huge. So this is one of the most unique things I've seen in one of these museums. Not only do they have a giant Therizinosaur, but they have all these movie posters from different productions that had dinosaurs in it. Or like terror, nothing like it in 150 million years, King Dinosaur. All right, folks, I'm loving every single second of being in this museum, but I've got to get on the road because I still have to get to Capitol Reef National Park. It was such an awesome place. I still love that I'm walking out and there's movie posters as I'm heading out, but definitely come check out this museum in Blanding, Utah. Let's get on the road to our next stop.
And now we're entering into one of my favorite stretches in the entire United States. I'm on Highway 95 in Southern Utah, and I'm starting to enter into Bears Ears National Monument. This to me is probably one of the most beautiful drives in the entire United States once you turn off of Blanding and head up towards Hanksville, Utah on your way to Capitol Reef. I'll show you a couple places along the way. I hope you enjoy them as much as I do. One of my favorite stops in Bears Ears, and one I normally try to make it at every time I come through, is actually the Mule Canyon Kiva. And so this is uh, known as the Anasazi site. And there's a number of Anasazi ruins in the area. So Anasazi were ancient indigenous people to this part of the country, the southwestern part of the United States. And they left a number of clues to their existence and to how they lived and this is one of those places just right along the road it's a nice stop for a bathroom it's got a nice paved trail that you can see behind me and we can come here and learn a little bit of history there are ruins here that you can look at now we're not allowed to walk into them but we can take a look and see how the houses were formed and you'll see here maybe a little different than what we saw in the pueblos in New Mexico is that they use the rock and mud here as opposed to the more kind of classic adobe style. They still use mud in between and we can see the mud. I don't want to touch it. We can still see the mud there but and they still formed a series of rooms. Now these look like these probably had doors here whereas at the Pueblins they often had their doors on the roof so they'd use ladders to get in and out. But similar to what we saw in New Mexico is one of these kivas and if you remember we just saw the single outline of a kiva here this one's actually been excavated and you can actually see down into it and see how large this room was but this is a nice look at what one of these kivas would look like on the inside and underground and here's a map of what this area looked like so we saw the rooms as we were walking up we saw the kiva there's also a tower we'll take a look at and then another kiva here. And what it says is the Mule Canyon Ruin was an open Anasazi habitation that had structures above and below ground. It was first occupied in 750, but the main occupation happened between 1000 and 1150. It says there were 12 rooms in here with a kiva and tower that were connected by crawlways. That's interesting. So they actually had a subterranean way to go between the rooms this is what they think it could have looked like with the tower and we'll take a look at the remnants of that here in a second the kiva and the room block and here's a little bit more about the Anasazi so Anasazi is a Navajo word meaning the ancient ones or ancient enemy who occupied the four corners area for about 1300 years 
The culture that was here eventually ended up disappearing around 1250 AD. So the question is what happened to those people? And some of that questions trying to get answered and it could be climatic changes. It could have been other people moving into the area that were more warlike that moved them out. It could have been because of deforestation because they had to use a lot of wood here. There's lots of things that could have led to the abandonment of these places. And here's what's left of that round tower. And you can see the little hole in there that would have connected to the kiva. And then as I walk over back to the kiva, you can actually see the passageway that would have led into the house back here or into the ruins. So what's interesting about this tunnel system is it allowed the people who lived in this structure to never have to go outside, specifically in the winter. So we are in, as I pan around, in a region that does get snow and probably got a lot more snowfall in the past. And because of that, they probably had a way to go to their stores, to their, to their religious ceremonial places, to their homes and other storage. And so they didn't have to go outside a lot when the weather was really bad here. And also probably for protection as well. So this would have been a multi-story tower where they can keep a lookout in all directions. And they can also signal to the other houses and families and tribes in the area. And here's some more of that house, the old Pueblo structure. And you can see where the rooms were subdivided and you can also see one of the largest dandelions I've ever seen in my life. Wow, look at that thing. <laughs> From the large dandelion room, if we continue on, we're gonna see there's different sizes and there's doors and they probably did like in these ones, it doesn't look like there's a uh, door. So I wonder if these had entrances at the roof level, much like we saw when we were in New Mexico. This one time was a thriving community here and it would have been really neat to see it in its heyday. All right, so getting back on the road again and going to work our way towards Hanksville, Utah. I'm not sure if I'm going to stop anywhere else along the way. I always get, as we like to say, squirreled as I'm driving here. There's so many beautiful places and there's so much history in this area that it's hard not to stop along the way. But I do want to get to Capitol Reef today. So we're going to try to stay focused, maybe make one or two more stops before Hanksville and uh, get you all to Hanksville. So I want to show you a very unique gas station, probably my favorite gas station I've ever gone to, and then head into Capitol Reef, which is only about half an hour from Hanksville or so. So let's get back on the road.
from Bears Ears National Monument to Glen Canyon National Monument, this US 95 or Highway 95 has some spectacular places to see as you can see behind me. So this is part of the Colorado River back here that drains all the way down to Lake Powell, which heads down in that direction. So we had some amazing scenery on the way so far. We're gonna to continue to see some amazing scenery from up here. I just wanted to show from this vantage point and just let you see how awe-inspiring beautiful this area is. This is known as the Hite Overlook. And so there's a little town of Hite that's down over there. And that's actually somewhere where people come down and they put in on the river or go down to the north end of Lake Powell. The geology here is spectacular and really everything we're seeing is on top of the Colorado Plateau. So that's where we're at right now is on top of that geologic province. And what happens is water and wind start eroding through all these geologic layers. It gives you this topography that we see today where it looks like things are very flat lying. And then as a river comes through, it creates these pathways around these features and they eventually erode out. Create some stunning views. Things like Monument Valley would be something similar to what we see here uh, with this type of topography. Things like Monument Valley would have this type of topography as well. Most people are pretty familiar with that. So, I wanted to show you a quick pan around of this spectacular view and on the road to the next section along Highway 95. I have made it to Hanksville, Utah, just about 30, 45 minutes east of Capitol Reef, my final destination for this evening. But I want to take you to my favorite gas station ever for a couple reasons. One, it's a Sinclair and it's called a Dino Care. Two, it's got dinosaurs on it. And three, it's actually built into the Entrada sandstone. So it's actually built into a rock. And so this is really cool, a very unique and unusual gas station. So right off the bat, I just love that they have dinosaurs at the top. And the name of the gas station is Hollow Mountain. Let's go take a look inside. So as you enter, we're actually inside of the mountain now inside of this rock and right when you enter here's the Sinclair Dino Care gasoline and here's all the distances to various places around even the world look Tokyo but I don't see a Houston on here oh, no Houston as I enter inside of this gas station we're actually in a tunnel they dug into the rock and I'll take you towards the back where you can actually see the rock that they dug into and you can actually see where they dug out the gas station and the restrooms are just on the other side of this rock. So this is part of the Entrada sandstone and so we can get an up close look at some of the geology here as well. I like that they left the original stone here by the bathrooms. You can actually see where they dug out and they would put drills in here, and put sticks of dynamite and then blow up the rock to create the space that we're in right now. In fact, you can see one of the holes there as well. 
All right, so one more stop and that'll be Capitol Reef National Park. I'm so excited to get there. It's been about a 21, 22 hour drive to get here and we're so close. All right, from my favorite gas station, it's about 30 minutes to 45 minutes going in that direction. So let's get on the road, get to Capitol Reef and call it a day. I made it three days on the road, made it to Capitol Reef National Park. I'm looking forward to finding a spot to rest and then taking you all on some adventures around this area. So with that being said, if you enjoyed today's episode, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this channel. Make sure to hit that bell for notifications. Thanks so much for joining me today and, and the last couple days actually on this amazing road trip. And make sure to take care.